So what the tyrants are scared of is what they cannot physically jail and physically change, and that is the mind and imagination of the people. That is why they target it first. That is why the weapons that the U.S. or any democracy can use against any tyranny is not weapons, actual weapons. Every terrorist in the world has now a weapon, and a weapon of mass destruction. The might is from the culture of the democracy. It is the, the allowing people to bloom and, and allowing the society to diversify and to tolerate this diversification. It is as Joseph P. Ellis, Ellis says in his book, it is in those 55 words at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, because that Declaration of Independence went against, became a mandate to go against the very founding fathers' way of life, namely slavery and, and, and women's uh, um, uh, lack of rights. Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass used it in order to, uh, to change the system. Now we use it for the same reasons. If that it will never get old. The Second Amendment might get old, but that will not get old. So, okay, um, enough propaganda from me. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to say at the end, and, and by the way, that issue of vape, which really gets me because they made vape for women an issue as if you know, you're either for it or against it. Um, some of the most amazing and intelligent and wonderful people I have worked with both in Iran and here had veils, and some of the most empty-headed women had not veils. So what? The point about the veil is that each woman should have a choice to, to, to dress the way she, she wants. And each of us has a choice to either criticize it or not agree with it. We can't be PC about these things. We can be frank, you can say, why the way is good, I can say why the way is bad, why the way is good, you know, all of this. It is the freedom of expression in order to stretch the society and, and, and make it more tolerant of itself. It is not an issue of political correctness and, and intimidating others so that they won't say anything. So to end with this, uh, Iranian people, uh, when, when people tell me your fight has been political, my fight was never really political. And, and even here, I think it pox on both the Democrats and the Republicans, it pox on both their houses. <laughs> None of them really satisfy me. And I want to be independent. But, but it is not a political issue only. It is an existential issue. It is an existential issue. And I want to end um, by talking about, talking about a paragraph or two about this this is a pamphlet by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She thought it was her best reading. I take it everywhere I go. And like all things I love, one of these days I'm going to lose it. Um, it's called Solitude of Self. And it is about why women should have the right to be emancipated. It is not like any woman's right thing you read, any right thing. It, it is one of the most lyrical um, testaments to freedom. And the reason it is lyrical is that it is not just political. It is existential. In Iran, for me, as a woman, as a human being, as a writer, as a teacher, confiscation of my identity meant death. That is why young girls in Iran are flogged, go to jail, are tortured, but they don't give it. And this is what Stanton says. She talks about um, why women should have the right. I won't read all of it, but um, she says, in discussing the rights of women, we are to consider first what belongs to her as an individual in a world of her own, the arbiter of her own dis destiny, an imaginary Robinson Crusoe with her woman Friday on a solitary island. Her rights under such circumstances are to use all her faculties for her own safety and happiness. The whole point is that the isolation 
the solitariness of every human soul and the necessity of self-dependence must give each individual the right to choose his own surroundings. The reason we need to have education for everyone and the right to vote and the right to self-expression -exp is because each of us are alone and unique. And she brings that uniqueness she says, nature never creates the same thing twice. Each of us are different. That is the reason for diversity. Because we are each unique. Now, this poetic testament to the rights of humanity, to the rights of each individual, is the basis of the best of American fiction, beginning with Huckfield. That is why you need fiction. Uh, Mark Twain said, Huck Finn is, about, is a book about the conflict between a sound heart. I think he said a depraved conscience. I think I'm making the depraved, he used another word. But anyway, and a depraved conscience in which the heart wins. Fiction, poetry, music, and in front of you I would dare to say science, is about the human heart. It's about the urges and longings of our individual solitariness and the way we connect through um, these expressions. Hot thing, it is not about success at each cost, each individual for his own, the Ayn Randian philosophy that is so popular today. It is not about, I want to make as much money as I can and to hell with you. You can't go to university, too bad. I bought a lot of real estate and I can take my children to a private school and pay a thousand dollars for my shampoo. It's not about that. And that is why when I, I think that our morality, our ethics, comes from our fiction. We read really Huck Finn and alongside of it, Sinclair Lewis's Bad which is very apt for the way, the corporate mentality today. We realize this. And I want to end by asking one question about, after we bail out everyone else, how are we going to bail out imagination and thought? And my answer is in this last scene, in this scene from Huck Finn about which many have talked. Um, do you remember when Huck is thinking about if he doesn't give up Jim, he'll go to hell? And he really believes that he's going to go to hell. It's not a joke for him. And he says, okay, I'll Jim, give Jim up. He says, my monitoring conscience was telling me, you're wicked. You're horrible. How could you do this? How could you not give Jim up? And he writes a letter to Miss Watson. And he gives Jim up. And then in a beautiful scene, he says, and then I imagined Jim in the morning. And then I imagined. And he goes on through all the times he was with Jim. And what a soulmate Jim was to him, how Jim saved him, how Jim alleviated his uh, loneliness. And he says, I then tore up that piece of paper and told myself, all right, I'll go to hell. I think today, as a people, we have to show our elite that we are a nation who is prepared to go to hell, but do the right thing. <laughs> and I hope we'll get into a conspiracy. <laughs> to do that. <laughs>